In this section, we will discuss some of the nuts and bolts of enzyme kinetics. To measure the activity of an enzyme, you first need to have an assay that allows you to detect the activity. Colorimetric assays are often very useful ways to detect the activity of an enzyme, as simple UV spectrophotometry can be used to measure the changes over time. In this type of system, a reaction can be started by the addition of the enzyme to a cuvette containing a substrate that will reveal a colorimetric product that can then be measured. It's easy to create a colorimetric standard such that the total amounts of product can be calculated. This is what a typical enzyme assay might look like. Notice that at the beginning of the reaction, the curve is in the linear phase. We refer to this initial rapid rate as the initial velocity, or V0. This is when there is little to no product and all substrate present. Over time, the reaction slows as the substrate in the mixture is used up, or the enzyme might denature due to the course of the reaction. Thus, when taking measurements of enzymes, only the initial velocity is used. Note that the initial velocity is the slope of the linear portion of the line and has the units of product concentration over time. If you run many different reactions with unlimited substrate and different concentrations of enzyme, you can make a cumulative graph of enzyme concentration versus the initial velocities of each of those reactions. You can see that if substrate is unlimited, that adding additional enzyme will cause an increase in the initial velocity that is linear. You can also analyze enzyme reactions using a set amount of enzyme and then use different concentrations of substrate. If you do these types of reactions and then plot the substrate concentration against the initial velocities of those reactions, you will often get a hyperbolic curve like the one shown here. Initially, when the substrate concentration is increased, the rate of the reaction increases considerably. However, as the substrate concentration is increased further, the effects of the reaction rate start to decline until a stage is reached where increasing the substrate has little further effect on the reaction rate. At this point, the enzyme is considered to be coming close to saturation with the substrate and is demonstrating its maximal velocity, or Vmax. Note that this maximal velocity is in fact a theoretical limit that will not truly be achieved in any experiment, although we might come very close to it. The relationship described here is a fairly common one, which a mathematician would immediately identify as a rectangular hyperbola. The equation that describes such a relationship is shown on the graph. The two constants, a and b, can be defined. In fact, the first one, a, we've already defined. This is v max. The b constant is the value on the x-axis that gives us one half the maximal value of y. This value, or the substrate concentration, at one half v max is called km, or the Michaelis-Menten constant. If we substitute these values into the equation, we can see that the initial rate of our reaction, or V0, is equal to the Vmax times the substrate concentration over the substrate concentration plus the Km. The michaelis menten derivation requires two important assumptions. The first assumption is that we are considering the initial velocity of the reaction or V0, when the product concentration will be negligible. So there's a lot more substrate than there is product, such that we can ignore the possibility of any product going back in this direction. The second assumption is that the concentration of the substrate greatly exceeds the concentration of the enzyme. The derivation then begins with an equation of the expression of the initial rate or the rate of formation of product. This will be dependent on the dissociation of the ES complex to form the enzyme plus the product. And this is based then on the rate constant for this part of the equation, or K2, and the concentration of the ES complex. 
as follows. Our V naught or initial velocity is essentially this change in product over time. And so that's going to be reflective then of this rate constant times the concentration of ES. Since ES is an intermediate in our reaction, its concentration is unknown. However, we can express this term in terms of other known values for the reaction. To do this, we need to think about the reaction at steady state. For an entire system to be at steady state, or for all the state variables of a system to be constant, there must be a flow through the system such that nothing has a net change. A simple example of such a system is the case of a bathtub with the tap running, but with the drain unplugged. After a certain time, the water flows in and out at the same rate, so that the water level, the state variable of volume, stabilizes and the system is in a steady state. So in a steady state approximation, we can assume that although the concentration of the substrate and the product changes, that the concentration of the ES complex itself remains constant. The rate of the formation of the ES complex and the rate of its breakdown must therefore balance at the steady state. So we can think about other mathematical ways of representing the formation of ES as the rate of the forward complex, or the K1, times the enzyme concentration and the substrate concentration and the rate of ES breakdown as a combination of breaking back down into enzyme plus substrate, which is dependent on the K negative one rate constant, and it can break down in the forward direction going to the enzyme plus the product, and that's dependent on the K2 rate constant. So we have these two rate constants multiplied times the concentration of the ES complex, and this will describe our breakdown of this complex. Thus, we can see that we can set these two equations equal to each other at the steady state. This is shown in equation one. We can then rearrange this equation to that which is shown in two, which solves for the ES complex. Previously, we graphically defined the Michaelis-Menten constant or Km, as the substrate concentration at one half V max. It is also defined mathematically by the other equilibrium constants in the equation, such that it equals the sum of the ES complex breakdown constants, K to the negative one plus K2, over the rate constant for the formation of the ES complex, or K to the one. Equation four then substitutes this Km value in for this constant, simplifying our equation. So since the concentration of the substrate greatly exceeds the concentration of enzyme, the concentration of the uncombined substrate is much greater than the concentration of the substrate that's bound with the enzyme in the ES complex. So we can essentially ignore this term when we're looking at this equation. However, we can't do the same thing for the enzyme. The unbound enzyme concentration is going to be expressed as the total amount of the enzyme minus the enzyme that's bound with the substrate in the ES complex. So since these two terms could be quite large, we cannot ignore the amount of the enzyme that's bound with the substrate for this equation. So we can substitute in this term for the unbound enzyme that's shown in this equation here. And when we do that and then solve for the ES complex, we can get the equation that's shown here in five. So this equation then gives us a mathematical term where we can evaluate the concentration of the ES complex in concentrations that we know from our equation. And so recall at the beginning of our talk, we were talking about evaluating this initial rate constant. And we said that it's dependent on the breakdown constant, or K2, times the concentration of the ES complex. So now we have this mathematical term that we can substitute in for the ES complex. When we do that, we get equation seven. And so you can see that V naught is equal to the rate constant 
for the breakdown of the ES complex, or K2, times the total concentration of the enzyme. And this is all multiplied by this term here of the substrate concentration over the substrate concentration plus Km. Now this part of the equation here, this K2 times the enzyme total, this is another mathematical expression for Vmax. Vmax is going to be directly dependent on this K2. We also have, the, have another name that we use for K2 quite often that you've already seen. This is our K-cat value, or our catalytic rate for the enzyme, or catalytic turnover. So, it's gonna, so Vmax is going to be dependent on K-cat times the total concentration of the enzyme. And so for this term, we can substitute in our Vmax value. And our final equation then for the initial velocity, or V0, is that it's going to equal the Vmax times our substrate concentration over the substrate concentration plus the Km. So this is the important part then of our conversation about standard enzyme kinetics. So let's think about what happens to the initial velocity then under some different conditions. Well, if Vmax is very large, we can see that this is a term that is directly proportional to the initial velocity. So if Vmax is very large, it's going to mean that our V0 is going to also increase. That's pretty obvious. But how about this Km term? What happens when we change this concentration? So if we have a low Km, this denominator is going to look more and more like the substrate concentration. These two terms would then almost cancel out, and V0 would be very close to Vmax. And as you can see, this is true graphically as well. If the Km is very small, like if we brought it back here, you can see that it would make the reaction increase even faster and move towards Vmax. So a small Km is going to indicate a better reaction rate for an enzyme. That's an important conclusion that we can make. Whereas if we have a large Km, it's going to make this denominator term much larger. And if we see that graphically, if we had a large Km, you could see it would take the enzyme a lot longer for it to go and reach the Vmax. So enzymes with a large Km are going to be less robust enzymes. So overall, the Km value is really a measure of the enzyme's affinity or its ability to bind with the substrate. And this is an inverse correlation. So a low Km is going to indicate a high enzyme affinity for its substrate, whereas an enzyme with a high Km will have low substrate affinity or binding. This can lead us to several conclusions. An enzyme with a low Km value relative to the physiological concentration of substrate will probably always be saturated with substrate and therefore act at a constant rate regardless of variations in the concentration of substrate within the physiological range. However, if you have an enzyme with a high Km relative to the physiological concentration of substrate, the enzyme will likely not be saturated with substrate, and its activity will therefore vary according to the concentration of substrate. So the rate of formation of product will depend on the availability of the substrate. This is one way that we can control enzyme activity in different systems. Also, if an enzyme acts on several substrates, typically we think that the substrate that has the lowest Km value is assumed to be the enzyme's natural substrate, although this might not always be true in all cases. If two enzymes with very similar Vmax in different metabolic pathways compete for the same substrate, then if we know the Km values for the two enzymes, we can predict the relative activity of the two pathways. Essentially, the pathway that has the enzyme with the lower Km value is likely to be the preferred pathway, and more substrate will flow through that pathway under most conditions. So this is really why enzyme kinetic analysis is very important. 
It gives us a window into what's going on at the cellular level and why it's happening. Very often, it's not possible to estimate the Km values from a direct plot of the velocity against the substrate concentration. This is because we may not be able to use enough substrate to get close to the Vmax to make an accurate prediction of the Vmax from the graph. That will in turn make the estimation for the Km value very difficult. It might be very underestimated if we use the wrong Vmax level. Fortunately, we can plot our data from our experiment in slightly different ways in order to obtain these values. The most commonly used alternative is the line weaver burke plot. This is called a double reciprocal plot, where it plots one over the substrate concentration on the x-axis against one over the initial velocity rates. This plot essentially linearizes the hyperbolic curved relationship that we see in the michaelis menten graph. The line that's produced is then easy to extrapolate allowing for the evaluation of both Vmax at the y-intercept and the Km at the x-intercept. However, we will see in our enzyme kinetics activity that there are many different ways that the data can be plotted to convert the hyperbolic graph into a linear one. Each way this is done will help us estimate Vmax and Km. However, when we linearize a hyperbolic graph like this, we're always going to introduce some amount of error into this type of reciprocal plot. And even a small change at a single point can then pretty dramatically change the values of Vmax and Km in some circumstances. You will get to take a look at this more closely in your assignment for the week.